Well, it's like this thing, the easiest acting exercise in the world, where you get them to lay in a soundtrack of sounds. Did you see those guys on this course? <laughs> I've seen it in courses, and I've noticed it when oh, I've been in, in my, you know, when I've been myself hired as an actor. Yeah. Because I've studied with you, I know about emotional sounds. Yeah. So then when I go into rehearsal halls on scripted shows, I, I see immediately that the actors don't make him, a lot of the actors don't make emotional noises. Because they're, in the, they're, they're intellectual. Yeah. But you should talk about, the, I, we know what we're talking about, but yeah. yeah. But anyway, I, you, you, <laughs> the first two people who did it, well, it was impossible to believe that the audience could not see it. They're, they're <laughs> gasping and groaning, and <laughs> they're, they're supposed to hide it from the audience. The actors should hide yes, that they're they making emotional it. sounds. They should make emotional sounds, mm -hmm. so the audience don't know they're doing it. And you can't believe that the audience can't see it, but these guys, that audience couldn't see it. So the actors come on, they play a scene, they make emotional sounds. Well, they first they play a scene, you just say, play the scene. Play the scene. No emotional sounds. Naturally, they won't make the they emotional don't. sounds. You might get one, mm. but you hadn't got any with these guys. But then they, then they went to town, it's like, you cannot, I cannot believe sitting there, the audience can't see it. But no, you ask the audience and they haven't a clue. But do they prefer the version yes. with the emotional sounds, but what, they don't know why? What they see is that the actors take more time, they're more physical, they're in more contact. If I say, what did I tell them? They say to relax, to focus on, <laughs> they'll say anything except that, no, they're making, they're making sounds. Okay, so this makes me want to ask about um, how you started to see those things. Because when, in the time that I've known you and worked with you, I feel as though one of the many things that you're brilliant at is seeing a, pro seeing a problem with improvisers or seeing a, pr a problem with actors. You see it differently and then you make up these games to help us correct it in a, in a fun way. And there's a difference from, to, between me and other people because if there's a problem, I don't leave it. Mm -hmm. For years, I stay with it. Because I give know an this, I know status. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Um, the problem was that the actors don't look real. They're acting. Mm -hmm. I told the story this morning of Eric, uh, uh, Alec McEwen going to the theatre in the late 40s in New York when the stagehand walks on the stage by mistake. <laughs> He's ruining the play. <laughs> and he does, it's not a comedy. The audience is silent. He doesn't know. He doesn't realize there's an audience looking. He doesn't realize that 800 or 1,000 people are watching him. The stagehand. Who's the stagehand. He's oblivious. Idiot. He's going to be fired. <laughs> it's just, you know, they're being ruined. But the stagehands, the actors are on the stage already for some reason, sitting around a table. And he says something to the actors, and they're acting, and they say something back. He still doesn't understand that the audience is watching him. <laughs> so, and it goes on. The play's continuing. I think that sounds amazing. How is it possibly going on? And <laughs> then he realizes he's seeing Marlon Brando. Is Marlon Brando sitting at the table with the other actors? No, he's, 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 he's a stagehand. Oh. <laughs> This is before Mar Marlon no, Brando is an this actor? Is, this became instantly famous. He started out as a stagehand? No. I'm so confused. <laughs> it's not a stagehand. He's an actor. Mm. But because it's Brando, oh. and he's wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and he doesn't look like 800 people are watching him, ah. and he doesn't do all this actor shit, and right. the other actors are very good actors, but they don't look real. Huh. They look like actors. So what is Brando doing differently? Brando is behaving. Instead All the instinctive acting. things. He's probably making sounds as well. <laughs> he's, a, he's human. They're very clever robots. Brilliant, genius robots. So I saw that. <laughs> I didn't see Brando, but I did see that my actors don't look authentic. So what? <laughs> 
And that took a lot. I did a lot of scenes at bus stops at the writers' group. And then I ran a studio for actors in London and did more. And then we, went, we were in central London, so we went to real bus stops and tried to look real. <laughs> Looked at each other from across the street. and uh, It was extremely difficult. And then I saw a special performance for members of the theatrical profession by Stanislavski's company. And they did, I think the Cherry Orchard, just, they did one of those plays. <laughs> the one that Brecht found funny in 1923, because they stopped in Berlin on the way to New York. And I found it a bit funny. Which play <laughs> was it? Do you know? I think it's the Cherry Orchard. The Cherry Orchard. No one could come on stage without an incredibly strong purpose. A servant couldn't carry a suitcase on the stage without some strong purpose. Is that good or bad? Well, it didn't look real. Right. Because sometimes <laughs> you're just carrying the suitcase. Yeah. Yeah. Do your job. There's a story, it's probably from Stanislavski, teaches out, directs opera. I think it's one of those books where <laughs> actor says, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Stanislavski, but I don't know my given circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And Stanislavski says, you're supposed to be entering in. in. Do you know how to enter an inn? Yes, well, enter the inn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know all these social, you have all these social skills. He knows how to enter an inn. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I went back to the studio. I said, I want to find the smallest possible <laughs> purposes because I've seen, I've just seen the cherry orchard. Well, they've handed, you know, they've been... Stanislavski died about 1940 or 44 or something. It's a long time ago. And actors have died and been replaced. And they've, you know, they've handed it on. They've all yeah. found these strong motives. That weren't there to begin with. No, well, they're yeah. not in the play. They're, not, they're acting. Yeah. And they'd pass them on to each other. Mm -hmm. So that for looking at, as, looking at it as anything real, it's nonsense. Which I think is why Brecht, Brecht said the acting was like putting a veneer of truth onto lies <laughs> back in, back in, what was that, uh, 1923 or something. Wow. Yeah. I'm not saying that's true, but mm. that's the point of view that some people have. And it didn't look real to me. So I, tr I said, could you try being slightly less important than your partner? Tiny bit more important, and there it was, <laughs> solved. Suddenly, good acting. Human behavior, no truthful acting. There uh, it was. Ah, uh, yeah. You just, and then you say, well, of course, really, human beings are trying to adjust their level of power against everybody they meet, mm -hmm. and when it goes wrong, there's the disturbance. But when it's normal, everybody has agreement, secret agreements, like how long each person should talk for him. Yeah. How long to hold eye contact? Yeah, all that stuff. And, and there's nothing, we were freaked out for a couple of weeks. I mean, there was nothing, we couldn't ask a question. We could ask a question, but they wouldn't answer it. They'd say, why did you ask that question now? Because they were into motives and they, they'd realize you're asking a question to change your level of power. Mm -hmm. So that was an eye open. <laughs> so simple. So now you teach it, and people think, oh, there, of course. <laughs> it took years to find that. Mm 